Welcome to Impatient History, the history of telling time, episode seven. In the Middle Ages, people knew roughly what time of day it was by the sun's position in the sky or the length of their own shadow. For many people, time was measured by how long it took to travel a certain distance or to do a particular task. In the absence of a time-telling device, a farmer might say that the walk to the next town takes one plowed field. A monk might measure a length of time by the number of prayers that could be said in its duration. For example, the sun shower lasted for three paternosters. But monasteries required more than the sun, shadows, and paternosters to determine the correct time for the performance of the divine offices, also called the canonical hours. These were the seven times of prayers, songs, and readings that monks performed on a schedule day and night, beginning at 2 or 3 a.m. with matins and occurring at intervals until about 7 p.m. It was common for monasteries to sound out the time of the divine offices with a bell. Monks were involved in all sorts of activities throughout the day, farming, laundry, cleaning, writing, reading, and a bell would call the monks from their duties when it was time to pray. In the wee hours of the morning, a bell would wake them and call them to matins. We've all heard the famous French nursery rhyme, Frère Jacques. Frère Jacques Brother Jacques has overslept Frère and neglected Jacques, his duty to sound the bells to wake the other monks. Until mechanical clocks were invented in the 13th century, how did monks know when to sound the bells? Ding, ding. At night, the monk tasked with watching the time would use the stars, a water clock, a candle clock, or even the cock's crow to determine the timing of the morning hour. For day or night timekeeping, many monasteries had water clocks into the high Middle Ages, but another very handy tool was the astrolabe. Astrolabe is a term from Latin and Greek that means star taking or star grasping. It is a device used for calculation and observation whose essential design can be traced back to the 2nd century AD. Astrolabes were used in Byzantium in the 6th century, and Muslims studied and perfected the astrolabe in the Middle Ages and passed their knowledge on to Jewish and Christian scholars in the West. Astrolabes are flat disks with moving parts that depict astronomical cycles. Generally made of metal, they are two-dimensional representations of the heavenly sphere that surrounds the Earth. A base plate is engraved with lines of altitude and azimuth for the latitude at which the astrolabe will be used. Atop the base is placed a reedy, a lattice representing important stars and the ecliptic. The reedy rotates around the center of the astrolabe, which represents the North Pole. A full turn of the reedy clockwise represents one 24-hour period. A medieval astrolabe could also be engraved on the back side of the disc with the 12 signs of the zodiac and the 12 months of the calendar. Astrolabes differed in design. Some contained more or fewer details depending on their purpose. And astrolabes could be equipped with several plates for use in different latitudes. As a unit, the astrolabe enabled the skilled user to determine the time, night or day, based on the position of the stars or of the sun. Additionally, astrolabes were used to predict the position of stars, set clocks, create more accurate sundials, find cardinal direction, and they could even be used as survey tools. They were used aboard ships to determine latitude until the development of the sextant in the 18th century. In Islamic lands, public clocks were not a popular item, yet muezzins needed to track the time to call out for prayers that had to occur at particular times day and night. Muezzins sometimes used astrolabes to determine the time to announce the prayers. We've covered many kinds of historical time-telling devices. Shadow sticks, sundials, and water clocks were used as early as 3000 BC. The early Middle Ages brought us candle clocks and fully realized astrolabes. As we come to the 13th century, scholars studied the ancient wisdom of the Greeks and Romans that was reintroduced at universities throughout Europe. We're entering the period of history known as the Renaissance. And at the beginning of this time, the next great advancement in timekeeping was developed. Find out what that was in our next episode of Impatient Histories. Thanks for watching.